Hey, and welcome to Think Like a Hacker, episode 21. We are now of legal drinking age. And uh, of course, we have the podcast that explores WordPress innovation and security. And uh, we've got a busy news episode for you at the beginning of this week. So let's get started. All right, diving straight in, Kathy. Looks like we've got an arbitrary file upload vulnerability in WordPress uh, user submitted posts plugin, right? Yes, we do. This one was discovered by uh, our friends over at Ninja Firewall. Uh, this was written about um, in early May, but we just started seeing um, active exploitation happening. Um, this plugin had about 30,000 installations. And the vulnerability allows an unauthenticated user to upload and run a PHP script. And since there are lots of PHP scripts with malware and backdoors, this was obviously a very dangerous vulnerability. Um, the plugin was uh, patched. It was reported to the uh, plugin team on April 27th, and they wrote about it a few days later. But we're just now starting to see some active exploitation, so we just wanted to do a quick um, public service announcement to everyone to watch out for these exploits. And if you are running this plugin, make sure that you have the latest version, which looks like it is kind of like a date stamp 2019 0502 to make sure that uh, you are protected. Yeah, no, this is a good one. And so this was on uh, Ninja Tech's blog. Let me get their mm -hmm. name right. It's uh, the Ninja Technologies Network, and I believe they make a, a WordPress uh, security product, uh, NintechNet. And what I love about this report is that in his blog post, he actually looks at the uh, PHP functions that the plugin author uh, calls. Uh, one of them is exif image type, and the other is get image size. And he actually goes and looks at the C source code of those, um, those PHP functions, because of course PHP itself is open source and it's written in C. So uh, uh, he or she, I'm, I'm actually not sure who the author is, um, but uh, someone at Nintech uh, went and looked at this and uh, they discovered that these functions, um, so, so the, the plugin author was using these functions to validate whether an upload is an image or not. And um, this researcher looked at these functions and the way they actually work and what they look at in the image file and realized that these functions uh, look at the image header and not much beyond that. So uh, exif, image t uh, exif underscore image type and get image size both do the same thing. And so by looking at the C source code of these PHP functions, uh, this researcher was able to reverse engineer a way to upload a, a malicious payload and pretend that it's an image and have it bypass these checks. And so as the researcher points out, you know, don't use these, um, these functions to validate that something is an image. You know, these functions are designed to give you data about an image, but they're not very good at validating whether something is, actually is an image. And it's a really great blog post. We'll include it in the show notes, but I thought that was quite impressive, Kathy. Yeah, definitely is very impressive. And it's um, a lot of people, you know, we get habituated into thinking that just because something has an extension on the file of .gif, that it's an image file, but we've seen numerous uh, pieces of malware hidden in ICO files. Uh, it doesn't matter what that file extension is if they can get PHP to execute using that uh, file on that server, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, I, I, if I recall correctly, the blog post explains how to actually uh, do um, image validation properly. And also uh, there's a function available that lets you create a safe uh, file name when you're storing an image, so it won't be executed as PHP by the web server. But uh, but yeah, that was a that's a really good one, and uh, we'll definitely include the link there in the show notes to uh, Nintex blog. So congrats to them. Um, yeah, and then I, I guess there's a, a new extortion scam that uh, threatens to ruin a website's reputation. Uh, this is via bleeping computer. And uh, Kathy, is this Catalan's reporting again? Or uh, no, this was I believe uh, Lawrence. Um... Lawrence Abrams right. at Leaping Computer. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I, I get I confused think. because Lawrence, uh, I guess, took over Catalan's job. He now writes for yeah. ZDNet and he used to write for Leaping Computer. So anyway, great article there from, from Lawrence. But um, the story there is that 
uh, one of their customer support engineers, um, well, one of our customer support engineers noticed that we've had this happen to a few customers. And so that's why we wanted to include this uh, in the, in the, um, the news uh, cost. Um, so um, a few months ago, some spam emails started making the circuit. And it, uh, you know, this is called, uh, actually, I think this was a couple of years ago, Kathy. I, I remember a friend telling me about this, where it's uh, this uh, sextortion campaigns where uh, okay. someone says that they kind of hacked your computer and they've been watching you do naughty things on the internet and they're going yeah. to extort you. And I, I guess this is similar in the sense that these, uh, these folks are saying that if you don't send them uh, 0.3 Bitcoin, which is approximately $2,400 at the time of uh, recording, they will um, basically sully the name of your website by generating a ton of spam that seems to come from your domain name and so on. And uh, they give you specific numbers in their threat saying that uh, they're going to generate, you know, X million numbers of, of spam uh, that mention your domain name and that spam house is going to blacklist you and it's going to significantly impact the uh, functioning of your business and so on. And um, uh, if your mail server is not configured securely, then they might actually uh, be able to do some damage there. But um, I think the trick here is to basically use SPF to configure your mail server to say that only uh, your server can send email from that domain. And uh, you can also use DKIM, which is another technique. And um, I, I think I'll just briefly touch on, on how those two work. It's, um, it's been a little while since I configured them, but an, S an SPF record is basically a text record in DNS that says that the following IP addresses are allowed to send mail for, uh, for this specific domain. And so if an attacker comes along and spoofs your domain name, they're sending it from an IP that's not on that list. The, uh, the mail servers that are receiving it are just going to automatically bucket it into spam or just even black hole the, the email. And uh, DKIM is, is similar. It's actually a way of signing uh, emails um, to authenticate that they came from the, um, the correct mail server. So um, it, it works via dig digital signature. You have a, a private key that's based on the mail server. There's a public key that is uh, in the... Um, uh, Kathy, is the public key stored in the, in the DNS record? I, I forget. Yeah, it's in the DNS information, and that's how they ver verify the signature. Okay. Um, and a domain can have several DKIM uh, public keys listed, uh, but, only ma but each matching private key is only on one mail server. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it's been a while, but um, so DKIM is a way to authenticate yourself as the, uh, the valid mail server as well, and uh, that will prevent this kind of uh, extortion from affecting you. So uh, you can just laugh off this email uh, extortion campaign, but if you haven't configured SPF or DKIM, then you should probably uh, sit up, pay attention, and go and set that up or talk to your ops team to, to get that done. Um, yeah, host hosting providers are pretty good at assisting with setting this up if you're using you know, your hosting provider is also providing your mail service. They're pretty good at, at setting this up for you um, just to protect your site uh, reputation. And also, you know, I, we in our site cleaning business, we have often had numerous customers come in and they're literally freaking out that, oh my gosh, I'm on a spam blacklist. Um, this It's a relatively common problem, especially like on shared hosting providers. Um, because you can be on the same site or the same server as a site that has been hacked and is actively having a problem. And hosting providers usually take this into consideration and want to like shut down sites that are sending spam or whatever. But IP addresses can get blacklisted fairly frequently and you know a lot of site owners worry about this. This is something that it's just kind of like routine maintenance of making sure that your site is is secure and that you're um, not on any blacklists and that you can adequately send emails. Um, but, th you know, people are afraid of this happening and they're afraid of what it's going to mean for their domain. And that's what I think this malicious attacker is, is preying off of. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the paranoia and, uh, oh my goodness, I better send 0.3 Bitcoin or $2,400 to this address. and. Yeah. You know, I guess until the next guy comes along and wants the same uh, amount of money or more. But um, if I recall correctly, we check to see if you have been blacklisted anywhere. Uh, are, are we still doing that with uh, with WordPress? Yeah. Yes, we do. We have procedures and policies in place that if a site is hacked, um, it, and WordFence itself will actually check your IP address and see if you're on any blacklists. And then part of our site cleaning process is to make sure that your site is clean because if your site has been hacked and has to get cleaned up, there's a possibility that it might end up on a blacklist or have problems with Google and 
our site cleaning team is really good at, at ensuring that the domain is cleaned up after, after an incident. Cool, and then I think there's some uh, web-based tools where you can go and put your IP address in there and it'll do sort of a meta search and check around 60 different blacklists. So um, we'll include that in the show notes as well. But Kathy, uh, the CBP story, <laughs> I, I think maybe you should run with this because I'm going to get, end up going off on some, some rant that's going to take at least half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I, I can't understand why. <laughs> okay. Well, this is kind of fresh, right? This just um, came out this afternoon, and we're recording this on the afternoon of June 10th. Um, TechCrunch is where we first saw it, but it's starting to hit other news sources as well. Uh, and CBP learned that a subcontractor in violation of the CBP policies and without their authorization, I'm sorry, <laughs> being hyperdramatic there, but they had actually taken um, copies of license plate image and traveler images collected um, by this subcontractor and um, that subcontractor is Perceptix and apparently they were once a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman um, and they are apparently the only provider of license plate reading and uh, facial recognition to um, CBP. Now, I, so, I just want to clarify something. So we're, we're sure. inferring that it is Perceptix based on the fact that they're the only uh, provider of this technology, right? Or, or has it actually been announced that it is them? Um, in the article from TechCrunch, it, it was announced that it um, that it, this breach came weeks after a report that Perceptix, um, who was this sole provider, was breached and that data was dumped on the dark web. Okay. Um, but it's not yet known if those two incidents are linked, but suspicious uh, correlation there. Yeah, and I guess what really got me wound up is in reading this article, you know, you've got the, the usual ducking and diving. Um, so. CBP for our international listeners or viewers is Customs, Customs and Border Protection in the United States. And um, it's one of the largest uh, sort of enforcement agencies, perhaps the largest in the, um, in the US, if I recall correctly, because we have, a, for example, a massive, I think it's the, the biggest land border in the world between ourselves and Canada uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a very big uh, agency. And um, what really got me wound up about this is that in the reporting, you know, C CBP is responsible for this data, but they're immediately pointing the finger at a subcontractor and they transferred the data without authorization and so on. And um, uh, I, I guess there's this pattern when we have a data breach where um, accountability is, is never on the the company that, that has actually had the breach. It's an employee that did something bad or a, a subcontractor, you know, or something like that. I mean, even with the Facebook um, issue with Cambridge Analytica, you know, it was, well, it's Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. They're the bad guy. And, you know, Facebook, you know, kind of pushes that message and, and stays on message. Right. And, uh, you know, here with, with CBP, you've got the same thing. And then there's other techniques that companies will use as well, which is, you know, it's a um, immediately uh, attributing it to an advanced persistent threat. In other words, you know, some large country spy agency probably got in. So it's not that we're incompetent. It's that they're just very good. Uh, and I, I, it really, really irritates me. And I think that the reason I think it's problematic is because it, um, it, it shifts accountability from, in this case, CBP onto this subcontractor. And, and so, you know, in, in the sort of post-mortem, what they're gonna do, a lot of energy is going to be put into fixing, you know, maybe firing the subcontractor. And by the way, they haven't been fired, um, fixing how relationships work with subcontractors and so on. But, you know, CBP in my mind is actually accountable in this case. And um, so that's, that's the, uh, the one point I wanted to make. And then the other is, you know, a few years ago, we had a, uh, the OPM breach. And if you, if you don't know what that is or, or you've forgotten, uh, it's the Office of Personnel Management. And what was breached there is the files of uh, everyone with um, secret or above clearance in the United States. And that included adjudication data, which is, you know, folks that have um, under uh, a polygraph, they've, you know, strapped on a polygraph and uh, taken a lie detector test, and they have had to admit any issues that they have, you know, alcoholism, an affair with someone, that kind of thing, so that that can't be used against them as blackmail when uh, they're in a top secret job, uh, you know, some 
foreign spy agency can't come in and try to uh, try to blackmail them into giving them data because uh, they've kind of already been through this um, uh, truth and reconciliation process, if you like, um, with a polygraph and with the, uh, the agency that's giving them their clearance. Um, and so that data was stored with OPM and that data was breached. And so it is quite possibly the most sensitive data that the government holds that was breached a few years ago. And that to me just was a very clear demonstration that if they can't protect that, then it's not possible to protect just about anything else. And um, you know, now we've got a breach with uh, CBP data and um, I think there's more to come. You know, I, I don't, I guess I don't want to get on my ideological uh, soapbox here and try to say, well, you know, you should vote for this person or vote for that person, or, you know, we sh you should support this policy. I, I think the point that I'm trying to make here is simply that when thinking about these things, assume that the data is going to be breached at some point. And even, you know, folks that are, you know, seem like they're mature, have gray hair, wear a nice suit and so on, and, you know, pat you on the shoulder and say, don't worry, son, we'll, we'll take good care of this. You know, we employ more math mathematicians than anyone else on the planet. Bullshit. You know, uh, th this proves that, the OPM breach proves that, and future breaches of very sensitive either government data or private data will, will prove that it is very, very hard to protect data. So I think it's important to think about what data should be collected in the first place. And um, for example, what the deletion policies of data should be and so on. All right, Kathy, I will stop. <laughs> I've been going on for a few <laughs> minutes now, but um, this, uh, this article just really irked me. And of course, it's just come out, um, I think two hours ago on, uh, on TechCrunch. And uh, it looks like you've got a Vice link in here as well now, Kathy, the, I guess they're covering it as well. Yeah, um, nothing major new that came out in that Vice article, just some more background information of who Perceptics is and um, and what their what their business model is basically. Cool. All right. Well, uh, very interesting uh, post here on uh, a model for WordPress accessibility. Don't you think? Yeah, it's um, obviously with the new Gutenberg editor in WordPress. Um, people are talking about accessibility because you have a new editor and it's just gone through an accessibility audit that was organized by WP Campus and funded by various uh, people, um, including Matt Muddle and Wegg. Uh, on May 27th, Adrian Roselli, who has been around for a while, um, posited a proposal of what should be done for WordPress accessibility. And in this proposal, he outlined um, basically arguing that Automatic should take some, take some leadership and fund accessibility uh, for WordPress. What do you think about this, Mark? Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I think Adrian has a lot of really great thoughts. Um, I think it's a well-written post and it's well-structured and there's a lot of like, good points in there. Um, I think that when it comes to accessibility, you know, th there's, a, there's a reality that I, I think a lot of people aren't acknowledging and, and that is that for um, companies, uh, individuals who work on software products and um, organizations, including you know, volunteer organizations like uh, the WordPress community, um, there, there's sort of a market size issue. And uh, this is a, a hard issue to you know, discuss. Um, I'm, I'm having to choose my words carefully when I talk about this, but um, the folks that need accessibility in software are uh, a much they're a minority, you know, they're, they're a much smaller group than uh, the folks that don't need it. And so when companies think about what they're going to prioritize, they don't put this at the top of their list. Um, you know, they, they'll prioritize things that serve a much larger market segment. They will try to please most of the people most of the time. And, um, and I think that's a reality that is not being acknowledged when it comes to accessibility. And so, so there's a lot of really great intentions and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people write about this, but there, there isn't the impetus to actually take action, to implement some of the things that Adrian writes about in, in his blog post. Um, and th there isn't the, the will, um, or if, if you're in a, a private company, there isn't the financial imperative to prioritize accessibility over the many, many other things that you ha want to build into your software. And accessibility is, is hard because uh, it impacts release schedules, you know, and every new feature that you implement that has a user facing element uh, has to go via the accessibility team and they have to make sure that it's accessible. Does it break accessibility? You know, does it, is this something that we need to do to add accessibility to this? And 
And that problem, I don't know that it's solvable by the companies, the, the, the entities that are affected by this. It's one of those things that feels a little bit like air traffic control or lighthouses where a regulatory body, the government in those cases, has to step in and say, okay, we're gonna create the FAA and they're gonna build you know, air traffic control centers around the country, the system's gonna be standardized and it's gonna interoperate well and we'll fund the whole thing. Um, this feels a little bit like one of those problems because you don't have the, that, that will, that, that impetus, that momentum to, um, to solve accessibility. And so with all of these great ideas, with all of these best of intentions, you know, it still continues to fall by the wayside. And um, you know, if, you, if you need software to be accessible, it sucks big time. I mean, it really affects your quality of life. And so I think that what perhaps needs to happen here is that the leadership in WordPress, you know, and I mean, maybe that's, you know, Matt and Josepha and, you know, the folks that are at the top, um, along with the support of the community, need to perhaps implement policies that create that will artificially, if necessary. So, for example, um, saying, well, plugins that are accessible will rank higher in the plugin search, uh, the plugin repo search al algorithm where people go to find plugins than plugins that are not accessible. Um, in other words, reward them, create those incentives and do it artificially and, and do it with the buy-in of the community. You know, don't just kind of impose this on everyone, but understand that the problem that needs to be solved here is not necessarily what should we do, but why will all of those developers and companies want to do it? Let's create the will that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a free market guy, you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, let's have more government regulation guy, but this really feels like one of those problems that is um, not going to be solved unless we have uh, something like that happen to create that, um, that incentive for uh, dev teams to continually, to add accessibility to their products and then continually keep those products updated and, and be excited about doing it because there's some reward. Uh, for, for them to, to do that. And maybe it's their, you know, their, their profile is elevated in the community or something like that. I guess we're gonna have to think that through. But um, Kathy, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Well, we do have some, although it's sort of in a microcosm, some incentive to hit accessibility. And it's beyond just, you know, we're, we're good people and we wanna make sure that the web is completely accessible. But the government does have something called Section 508. And if you are a university that receives government funding or an organization that receives government funding, you are required to adhere to accessibility standards. Um, Section 508.gov has a number of helpful guides and, and tools that can help you determine if you're accessible. But it's such a small part of the overall, um, I guess, business industry that's using the web, it, it's just that incentive just is not big enough uh, for it to, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know the financial motivation for, for plugin developers or for theme developers or for WordPress as a whole. I mean, it's sort of an organization that wants to democratize publishing and that is the mission of WordPress.org. Uh, and to democratize, you have to be inclusive and you have to include everyone. Uh, so I, I think these kinds of um, these goals need to be um, integrated into that overarching mission as WordPress as a whole. Because the financial incentive, I mean, I, I know a lot of plugin developers who are not making making bank, so to speak, with their plugins. They're, they're doing it for the good of the community. They're doing it for, because they have passion for, for WordPress and for what can be done with it. And they had an idea and, and brought it to life and it serves a number of people. And so they maintain plugins because of that, sort of this altruistic. And they're, so there's no like financial incentive for them to like go through the rigorous testing that accessibility can require. Mm. Yeah, I don't know that the incentive has to be financial. You know, those folks wrote those plugins and the, that software for a reason. Um, and maybe it's fame, raising one's profile in the community, that kind of thing. And so sure. doing more of that um, as a reward for adding and maintaining accessibility uh, could work. But um, I think, you know, these, uh, these sort of rumble strips that you have as you approach a traffic light, 
that um, alert the uh, visually impaired to the fact that they're approaching an intersection and then the, the ramps that um, go down from sidewalks to uh, level crossings and so on. I, I don't know what the, the policy is there, you know, how those get implemented, but I don't think that a, a construction crew gets together and out of the goodness of their heart, they, they build these, these things. Right. Um, so it might be a good model, sort of an analog to look at for the WordPress community to figure out, okay, well, what incentives or, or regulatory powers are put in place or exercise to, to make that happen, and perhaps we can... We can, uh, we can learn from that. But in, anyway, um, great uh, blog post from Adrian Rosselli, and um, you can find it on adrianrosselli.com, and we'll definitely include that in the show notes. So, uh, so nice job, uh, Adrian. Um, and unless you were on the moon, you heard that Google had a huge outage. Did that affect you, Kathy? I was actually like out in nature enjoying, I think it was a nice day for a change in Phoenix. <laughs> so I, I didn't even know it was happening. Yeah, I think it was happened on like a Sunday afternoon or something, and I was like offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how about you? Did it affect you? No, it actually didn't. Um, yeah, I, I was somewhere as well. I actually, think I was working, but I, I think I might have been doing something local on my machine. So I don't think it affected mm. me, um, but it affected uh, a lot of folks and services that uh, Google uh, provides, and a lot of. Um, uh, companies that use uh, Google services like YouTube uh, and uh, Snapchat. Of course, YouTube's part of Google, but uh, Snapchat, for example. And um, apparently they were uh, making a routine configuration change and it ended up in this kind of cascade of uh, failures. And the troll became really bad because the management traffic on, the inter on the, their intranet was uh, throttled. Um, as, as part of this outage. And so they actually had a hard time accessing their own network when they were trying to fix this. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, the story's been around for a few days now. Uh, Wired's got some good coverage on it. If you want to uh, look at what a sort of cascade of network failures look like and perhaps feel a little bit of what the Google engineers felt when they realized they couldn't access their own network to fix it, it's, uh, it's definitely a good read. So check that out and we'll in include it in the show notes. And then um, this story... <laughs> Um, uh, the, I think the t title of the blog post was State of Industrial Control Systems in Poland and Switzerland, which sounds kind of innocent, but uh, this really caught my attention. You know, um, uh, Kathy, this illustrated to me how vulnerable huge swaths of the internet still are, huh? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, th this reminded me a lot of uh, <laughs> it, it just. It, like intelligence and war <laughs> because yeah. it was just showing you how um how vulnerable and how how the tools exist now to do this kind of espionage research of where vulnerabilities can exist and not just like in a website like wordpress but it, at your hospital <laughs> yeah. up to people's so, life. So, so the story here is that there's a tool called comerica and i think it's been around for a little while and this tool is used to map parts of the internet and um, uh, it uses Shodan, which uh, if you don't know what Shodan is, you can go to shodan.io, uh, S-H-O-D-A-N.io. And uh, Shodan is used by the information security community. It maps uh, open ports on the internet, systems that are, are listening on certain ports, certain network ports and so on that perhaps should not be listening on those ports and should not be accessible to the public. So one of the things you can do with Shodan is you can find cameras for example, that are accessible to the open internet. And some of those cameras don't even have any authentication. So they're, I guess what you call IOT devices or internet of things uh, devices that have a, um, an internet interface. And uh, Shodan has traditionally been used to expose things like that, telnet ports, things like that. And Comerica um, takes Shodan data and combines it with Google Maps and lets you see where these things are on a map. And I think it uses it, it combines a few other things like uh, Twitter and, and so on. Well, they did an update to Comerica that um, really focuses on industrial control systems. Now, uh, uh, industrial control systems or ICSs are computers that manage things like factories, power stations, and so on. And um, the, the, the really important infrastructure that a, a country relies on. And so, you know, there's some very famous cyber attacks against ICSs. Uh, Stuxnet is, of course, one that's super famous. Um, that's where allegedly the US and Israel used a, uh, some malware to 
destroy centrifuges at the uh, Natanz facility in Iran, where they were um, uh, purifying uranium for use in potentially a nuclear weapon of some kind. Um, and that was a successful attack against an ICS. Um, there's also the, uh, the Black Energy malware, which targeted um, power stations in the Ukraine back in 2015. And uh, that, took, that was actually successful. And it took down um, 30 substations were switched off and uh, folks lost electricity from one to six hours. And the attribution there, you know, attribution's hard, but the, the word is that it was uh, the Russian Federation that was targeting Ukraine with a cyber attack. So again, you know, a cyber attack that successfully targeted an industrial control system and, uh, and affected, significantly affected the operations of a country. And so um, this update to uh, Comerca uh, looks at showdown data finds industrial control systems, uh, uh, lets you know that they are open to the internet, um, puts them on a map and integrates it with Google Street View so you can actually see, you can look at the, the facility that is running this open system, uh, even do a kind of physical security audit because you're, you have photos of it from, uh, from Google Street View. And um, this is pretty scary. I mean, it, it's... Um, uh, as, as I think you were pointing out, Kathy, it, it, it is like an uh, intelligence gathering tool that a military would use when preparing to target an attack on a country's infrastructure, right? Yeah, it, these, the, the point was made in this article that these ICS systems should not, have, should not be on the internet, right? They shouldn't be accessible on any port, <laughs> but they are. And just to be able to see what's accessible and exactly where it's at. And if you read the article and actually look at it, there's like a map and you can just like, <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. this is crazy that yeah. so many industrial control systems, just in Poland right here, I can see, I, I don't know, I feel like I'm in World War II and um, planning for an invasion, <laughs> just looking at all of these juicy little targets. It's kind of a crazy, um, crazy vibe you get when you really look at this. And if you're thinking like a hacker, and you're looking at the vulnerability that that may exist in some of these ICS systems and what they are connected to, and this, you know, tool just kind of underscores how how fragile systems can be, and the people who are allowing these to be accessible via the internet, um, the, <laughs> the vulnerabilities that they're bringing forth. People need to uh, secure these things and take yeah. them offline. For sure. So I guess uh, I had two thoughts when it came to this. Um, you know, the one is that this kind of research where sunlight is considered the best disinfectant can be really, really scary sometimes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, I, guess, I guess there's two paths here. The one is don't tell anyone uh, or maybe just tell some of these industrial control systems um, the, the, the owners of those ICSs that their systems are online, but that's incredibly labor intensive. You know, this is uh, an individual, I, th I assume it's an individual researcher or, you know, an individual or a small group of developers that's creating Comerica. And they don't have the, um, the resources to go and, you know, alert every single ICS worldwide, hey, you know, your, your stuff's online. And in a lot of cases, you know, when you alert these big organizations, they don't care. And so uh, putting this out there really shines a, a very stark light on, on the issue here, and uh, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll no doubt get some action. Um, but it is really, really scary, and it's quite a visceral experience, as you said, you know, looking at this map and going, oh, wow, like there's a bunch of military targets for a military uh, cyber, uh, cyber attack team. Um, so that's the, the, um, the one thought that I had. And, um, you know, the other, the other thought that I had is that... Uh, I, it feels like large parts of the internet are still very insecure, and it's going to take time for that to um, to kind of be mitigated uh, for for teams of uh, you know cybersecurity professionals and uh, you know government employees to actually secure systems like this. And you know what what bothers me is that I think perhaps a couple of decades from now things are going to look vastly different. Uh, cybersecurity is going to be a way of life. Um, you know, we're, we're all going to be, we, we would have incorporated it into our personal lives, into our business lives, operations teams, will, probably half of the teams will be security professionals um, working around the clock to secure systems and so on. And so, you know, the, 
this might sound crazy, but the thought I had when I saw this is it feels like there's an opportunity right now for an up and coming player who isn't necessarily as well funded as the large um, uh, superpowers, you know, like the United States and China, but does have a kick ass um, cyber military. I'm sorry, I'm using the word cyber so much, but um, <laughs> that, that has a, a kick ass military operation um, sort of outfitted with hackers to go in and um, and actually do some serious damage that they wouldn't have been able to do before or they won't be able to do a few decades from now. And so, you know, we'll, I guess we'll see how this unfolds. But that, that, that's a thought that I had that there's, you know, when, when you see this stuff plotted on a map and these are industrial control systems that are connected to mission critical systems where if those systems are damaged or taken offline or, you know, explode or whatever, um, they significantly affect a country. Um, in, a, in a very bad way, the same as a, a kinetic uh, attack would, you know, if you shot a missile at these things. Um, it just feels like we're, we're at a very special moment right now where if you are a small country that wants to do some really bad damage and you know how to um, attack these systems, you, you can do that. And, um, and so it, it leaves me deeply concerned. But, uh, but yeah, moving on. Um, so a quick note, and this is really to hosting providers and folks in operations teams, there's a severe vulnerability in Exum, which is a, a mail server or a mail gateway. And uh, it is actually an RCE, but it's not a remote code execution vulnerability, it's a re remote command execution, although the, uh, the command is executed as root. Um, the versions that are affected are from 4.87 to 4.91 inclusive, and this was fixed uh, in version 4.92 on February 2019, but the fix was never announced as a security fix. And so a lot of um, operating systems like Ubuntu that are bundled, that, that come with Exum, have been bundled with a vulnerable version of Exum. And so definitely check what version you're running. And if you're running a version prior to 4.92, especially if you're running 4.87 to 4.91 inclusive, then you're gonna wanna scramble to get this fixed. Um, and uh, yeah, we just wanted to kind of include that quick note for, uh, for ops teams out there. Definitely check the version of XM you're running in production and, uh, and take a look at that. But um, SIM swapping. Uh, so there is a, a really interesting article written um, on, I guess it's on Medium, and it's written by uh, someone in the crypto space, Kathy, on how to, uh, what to do when SIM swapping happens to you. Yeah, the person, I mean, they're going under the name Cypher Blade. Um, wrote this article on Medium under the My Crypto uh, publication, uh, and it, they published on June 5th. And we've been talking a lot about SIM swapping or SIM attacks um, or SIM porting, it can be called port out fraud, phone porting, SIM hijacking. There's, there's various ter terms for what happens here, but the actual event is all the same. Um, and the article is really helpful because it basically tells you what to look for when uh, a SIM jacking or a SIM port attack is happening, um, how you can prevent it. Uh, it's, it's a rather long read. I mean, Medium puts like how long of a read, how much of a commitment you need to make to an article. Uh, and this is 50 minutes, so it's a, a high school class basically in how to protect yourself For sure. yeah. um, with two-factor authentication. Uh, what struck you, Mark, in terms of um, the most important things from this article? So I, I guess, um, so, so again, and Kathy, I might be repeating a little bit of what you said here, but SIM swapping is when uh, someone calls your cell phone provider, pretends that they're you, and they get that provider to assign your SIM to their phone. Um, and they will then receive SMSs that are destined for you uh, and, and phone calls and that kind of thing. And that's um, the, the way, and, and I think they spell this out in the article, but a, a great example of how this is exploited is with Google, if you've lost your password, you can say to Google, okay, well, I want to authenticate some other way. And uh, you know it'll ask you a secret question, or it'll take you through a series of steps. But eventually, if you keep saying, "I want to try another way," "I want to try another way," eventually they say, "Okay, great. Well, we'll send a code to your phone, and if you can tell us what the code is, then we know that you got your phone and you proved that you are you, and so we'll then allow you into the account. And if someone has ported your SIM or, SIM or um, 
swapped your SIM to their phone, they get that code, they can sign in as you, now they've got access to your email account and they can start mining that email account to see what services you use. And one of the first things that they do is they'll look to see if you use any cryptocurrency uh, services, they'll figure out what those are and then they'll uh, go to the lost password option on that site. They've already got access to your email, they've already got access to your phone by doing a, a SIM port and they can uh, do the forgot password thing. Uh, if you've got two-factor authentication enabled and it's SMS based, they will receive the code that's sent to your phone as well and they'll sign in as you. And then they keep going through your various services and so on. So that's, that's how it works. Um, you know, as we mentioned on the previous episode, we recently launched a standalone plugin called WordFence Login Security, which uses, um, does not use SMS based two-factor authentication. Um, it uses time-based one-time passwords. And of course, WordFence does the same thing now. Uh, we've gone, we've, we've moved away from SMS. We're considering it legacy. We're continually encouraging people to move away from it because of exactly this attack. And so one of the things that really um, caught my eye in the article, and I think this is probably the, in, in my humble opinion, the most useful piece of data that I saw here is, how do you know if, you, if someone is busy, um, if someone has just ported your SIM, if someone has just SIM swapped you? And so there's a few signs here. And again, as Kathy mentioned, it's a, it's a long article. It's worth a read. Um, once you uh, read the whole thing, you'll be an expert um, and uh, might need to sleep for a couple of days because it's, it's quite long. But um, <laughs> you, uh, so, so some of the signs are you may receive a call or text from your phone carrier support agent um, if the attacker disconnects in order to try again. And so the reason this might happen is because what an attacker will do is they'll try to get a gullible, let's say AT&T or T-Mobile agent on the line. And if the agent doesn't seem gullible enough, they're like, hey, well, I'm not sure that you are who you say you are. They'll just hang up and they'll try the next one. And they'll keep doing that until they get to like the 15th agent where the agent's like, oh, cool. Yeah, uh, we can do that. I know you're having a bad day. I'm sorry that your parent just died. And let me, let me see what I can do here. Um, and so because all of these agents will be hanging up on the, the individual who's doing this, the attacker, uh, you might get a call from an agent saying, hey, we got disconnected. Um, and uh, uh, so that's one of the, the, the telltale signs. Uh, the other is that you will suddenly and unexpectedly have no cell phone reception because of course your SIM has been ported to a different phone. So your phone is, um, as far as the cell phone network is uh, con uh, concerned, your phone is dead. If you reboot your phone, it won't help. And I remember, you know, you might have Wi-Fi enabled, you might be at home, so even, you know, your, your, um, if your cell phone signal dies, it might still appear that your phone is online. So check that little signal indicator in the top right to see how many bars you've gotten if the AT&T logo appears there or whoever your provider is, because if that disappears, uh, that's a sign that your SIM might have been ported. Um, you might also have uh, notifications that came through before your phone lost service, or if you're still on Wi-Fi, uh, you could see su suspicious emails that came through from your phone carrier or password reset emails from various services. You know, these are signs that folks are are pinging your accounts trying to get in and um, that could happen, uh, that sort of might be a precursor to right before you're, they actually successfully port your, your SIM. Um, you might also have a system notification stating that you can no longer access a phone level account and need to re-enter your password. Um, on Android, you might see something that says this account was added to a new device. Uh, of course, the, the, your SIM has been uh, ported to a new phone and um, uh, security products, including I think ourselves, have the ability to detect if, detect if a new device is signing in and they'll kind of up the, uh, the sensitivity and uh, send alerts to users and that kind of thing. So if you see an alert like that, that's a potential sign. On iOS or your Mac computer, you may have a, uh, are you attempting to log in from Los Angeles, California or Ukraine or something like that appear. And uh, that could also be a sign that someone is about to port your SIM or is, or has already ported your SIM. And if you use uh, any non-SMS two-factor authentication that have uh, push notifications set up, then you might get a uh, thing that says, here's your code that you requested, even though you're not trying to sign in anywhere. So, you know, the trick is to just have really good situational awareness when it comes to being online, being on your device. If you see things that are weird in your email inbox on your device, push notifications that you didn't expect, things popping up on your desktop saying, you know, uh, are you trying to sign in? Or, you, you know, you have just signed in from somewhere drop what you're doing and react immediately because the, the modus operandi, the MO of these attackers is that um, they will get as much out of your, out of compromising your inbox as they possibly can. For example, these folks that are, uh, that are stealing cryptocurrency, they don't just go in and withdraw any cryptocurrency that you have in your, uh, in your 
say Coinbase account or some other you know crypto service uh, account, they'll actually uh, they'll do that, and then they will. You, you, if your bank account is linked to that service, they will withdraw as much money as they possibly can from your bank account, turn it into cryptocurrency, and then take that as well. Then go back to your inbox and see what other services you're doing and you're, you're using, and keep going. So it can be incredibly damaging uh, if you are compromised in this way. And unfortunately, the cell, cell phone providers don't seem to have beefed up their security so that they're impervious to these social engineering attacks. So they're a weak point. Um, and so the trick is to up your own awareness of signs that you're being targeted or being attacked and uh, react very quickly when it happens and you might be able to limit the damage. Kathy, how, how's that sound? Anything you wanna add? Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, the thing that I really liked from this article is um, panic correctly. Be like the duck. <laughs> Calm on the surface, but paddling like hell underneath. Uh, and I mean, obviously, if you start seeing signs like Mark has just described, you're going to freak out, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what happens in, in a, a, a difficult situation. Any kind of um, sort of blindsided situation, whether it's a car accident or someone has, you know, fallen and can't get up or whatever, like, stressful situation happens, it's good to have a plan. And I really like this article because it gives you the plan. It tells you what to do first. I'm going to bookmark this <laughs> because this is like a good plan. Maybe I'll even like print it out or something because you have to be aware that you you can't call your phone provider if your phone's not working, right? If your SIM card has been ported, if you're under a SIM attack, your phone's not going to work, right? right? So you have to have a plan in place. Assume that this is, is happening and what are the steps? What is your... Uh, SIM port attack incident response plan look like? And this walked me through, you know, as I was reading it, um, making sure that your phone is turned off so that, um, make, first of all, making sure that you have an alternative phone um, available. Um, ask that your phone number is turned off so that no SIM card is working for your phone number whatsoever. Um, and then just kind of like do your investigation, figure out exactly what happened, make sure that your accounts are locked down. And it walks through so many different things that that you can do and sort of the mindset that you adopt when you're in an incident response. I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I know I think the key here really is to think like a hacker. You know, we in, internally, and I've mentioned this before, uh, we do uh, tabletop exercises where we war game certain scenarios uh, of uh, folks attacking WordFence in various ways. We have red team exercises where uh, uh, one of our, uh, our team will uh, try to attack us in, in various ways, and um, that's always fun. You know, I was watching, uh, you ever see World War Z, Kathy? World War Z, no, I haven't seen that one. It's that uh, zombie flick where uh, there's- Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, with Brad Pitt, but there's this great scene in it where uh, you know, the whole world has been overrun and Israel is the one country that built a wall before anyone else could to block the zombies. And so Brad Pitt is this investigator, he used to work for the United Nations and he goes in there and he's trying to figure out how did they, how did they know? And he's talking to this guy who's an intelligence official and he says, well, uh, you know, based on previous experience, we came up with this concept called the 10th man. And so if we have this thing that we think is so absurd that it can't possibly be true, it's the 10th man's duty on this committee to say, well, I'm going to assume it is true. And, and they did that with zombies because they heard something out of India or somewhere where, this, this, where the zombie thing started that the explanation was zombies and everyone on the committee was like, no, no, of course it's something else. And the 10th man was like, it's zombies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so pretend that the zombies are coming for you and beef up your security posture. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a great film. You should watch it. <laughs> I, I should. I definitely should. I, I think it's important, you know, people, I think, I, I've talked to a few people sort of in the WordPress community, I've been to a few meetups, um, and, and we've talked about this, and they're like, oh, well, I don't invest in cryptocurrency, or I don't have that much, or, yeah. You know, and it's, it's sort of the same type of thing as my website is too small to get hacked, right? And people think, well, why would they come after just little old me? They're after, you know, the big crypto investors. And basically, the, the big crypto investors, as far as SIM porting attacks are, they're the, just the canary in the coal mine. We're all using some kind of device <laughs> for uh, SMS. Uh, SMS is just inherently insecure. And watch those canaries, <laughs> because they're going to tell you what, uh, what's coming for you next, right? For sure, yeah. And uh, definitely react very, very quickly if you see any of the signs that we mentioned. Yes. So, you know, great article there. Uh, we'll include that in, in the show notes as well. That is 
it for this week's news. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us a review and uh, we very much appreciate that. Thanks very much for watching. Have a wonderful week. Bye everyone.